Well, good morning, and uh, we are back from our break for Christmas, and um, for those of who are going to be joining us either live or later on, at this point we have one person who's joining us live, but I mean, I just pushed play or record about 20 seconds ago. Uh, welcome. Uh, you know, I am thankful that um, we were able to do this now where we can do it live and, and then do it via Facebook. I mean, you know, the thing with, um, you know, Omicron is it's highly contagious. And, um, you know, if you aren't aware, you know, there are lots of people who are getting it. The other good thing is, is that it's much different, or at least it seems to be um, much different than the earlier variants where uh, it's more contagious, but it's not as um, severe. So, uh, it went through my family, and um, uh, the only one who's having any little effects, and it was still like a cold for everybody, is my wife. And, um, and so, those are good things, and um, we are in Deuteronomy, and um, we're gonna be talking about um, sexual purity in Deuteronomy today. I give you that little teaser because um, I'm going to ask you a question on uh, sexual purity. So I'm going to let you get thinking, but first we are going to pray. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for today, and we ask that you would bless us as we have the gift of being able to gather in person, online, live, as well as just being able to um, work together in a uh, Bible study on Deuteronomy, we ask your Holy Spirit to bless us, to help us, to um, speak your words into our lives and, um, and help us to grow in our knowledge and our love and our appreciation for your words of life. Uh, pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, I think we're in Deuteronomy around chapter 22. 22. And, um, and we had 22, verse 6. observations is we're, 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 kind of, we're working through details where Deuteronomy is listing out um, specific stipulations about how to live into this covenant with God. Um, another way of looking at it, and, and just so you know, this is my, I mean, this is my preferred way of referring to the Ten Commandments, is they're the ten words of life. Um, we've talked about this in our study, that um, they're not called Ten Commandments. They're called Ten Words. Um, you know, we, we tend to summarize them. They are commands, so they are in the imperative. But, um, you know, these are the words given to Moses, written by the finger of God. And, and they, what they are really is, is that they're a summary of the covenant. But then the covenant gets fleshed out. And our working analogy is, is okay, you were slaves in Egypt. I brought you out of Egypt with a mighty hand. And now I'm going to tell you how to live because you've been conditioned for slavery, but that's not the life for you. So, um, so here's what it looks like. And so you get these 10 words. Um, and then out of those 10 words, it's like, well, let me, let me really tell you, flesh it out. Um, I'll, you know, I'm telling you, go fly. Well, let me give you details about how you might do that. So, um, the structure of this section, which is the heart of Deuteronomy, you know, three speeches that Moses gave on the plains of Moab as the Israelites were preparing to go into the promised land. Moses was going to be staying behind. He dies. He's 120 years old. And he was told that he would not be able to enter the promised land because of his own rebellion during the wilderness wanderings. Um, but in this heart of it, as we're going through, it is pretty much following the structure 
of the ten words. So it begins theologically with God, no other gods, um, no idols, don't take the Lord's name in vain. Um, and then it moves forward of observing Sabbath. And then and we start getting some other ways in which we're to observe time for God. And then honor your father and your mother. And then and then do not murder. And and with and with the murder, it, we then have been in this for a little bit now. Where okay, let's talk about this stuff because not not everything's murder. Um, and so there's stipulations about how you go to war. Um, and going to war is not the same thing as murder. It should be done by what God says. This is for the nation of Israel, which is, is functioning as a theocracy where God is really supposed to be in charge. Um, we are still in this section a little bit um, where we're being told something about honoring the sanctity of life. So um, I'll, I'll backtrack just a little bit. If a man, so in chapter 21, verse 22, if a man guilty of a capital offense is put to death and his body is hung on a tree, you must not leave his body on the tree overnight. Be sure to bury him that day because anyone who is hung on a tree is under God's curse. Cursed is anyone who's hung on a tree. Now that's significant because that gets referenced as we come into the New Testament about how the Old Testament is sitting there and saying, okay, so when somebody's hung on a tree, it, it, it signifies that they have broken God's law, they are under God's curse, they've received this punishment, but we don't want to defile the land. Um, and so um, you, you'll take the body down. This ends up, Jesus gets crucified. Um, he wasn't on a tree, but he was on a piece of wood, but that symbolically for the Jew, is a tree and so there you go and you see you know the stipulations that the Jews asked the Romans to take um, people down from the crucifixion um, so that's here's this stipulation it's teaching us something it ends up being caught up into the story of Jesus's life death resurrect and crucifixion and resurrection um, it's good news for us because what happens is, is that while Jesus died under the curse, because he was our perfect sacrifice, the curse got broken. Um, the death is not the end for those who are in Christ. So this little verse here plays a part in helping us theologically understand what it means for us to be saved. Um, chapter 22, verse 1. If you see your brother's ox or sheep straying, do not ignore it, but be sure to take it back to him. If the brother does not live near you or if you do not know who he is, take it home with you. Keep it until he comes looking for it, then give it back to him. Again, theme here, respecting and cherishing life. Um, you know, and, and livestock represents both just the life of this animal as well as the impact of having this animal for a family, um, especially agrarian based. And so all of this says, I want you to show care and concern for one another. Um, I want you to uh, inconvenience yourself um, so that you might help other people. Um, now, it's important for us to understand that, you know, that these commandments, these stipulations, these laws are all part of the Torah. Um, and I'm going to use the word Torah here. Um, the Torah refers to the first five books of Moses, but it's also the way that we refer to the covenant given by Moses. Um, I did a Bible study, if you didn't see it, on Romans 7 um, for the sermon on Sunday. Uh, the reason, I, I, I explained it a little bit, but the reason I did it is, is that we were going to cover all of Romans 7, and Romans 7 had so much stuff in it, I was like, and this is just my proclivity, I hate telling you, just trust me, believe what I tell you, but that's what it means, and so I'd rather show you, and so I was just like, I'll, I'll, I'll just do a Bible study, it'll make it easier, 
I can flesh out the details and then when I preach, you know, if you're, if you're interested, you can look at it. But in doing that, Paul was talking about the law. But for Paul, when he says law, your first guess should be Torah, the Old Covenant. Now, the Torah, the Old Covenant, has commands to it at its basis. This is God speaking. But when we think about the Torah, what we should be thinking about is um, our God, our King, even our parent, who wants us to grow, to flourish, to learn, and to become wise. And so one of the things to think about is, is that, yes, we're being told what to do, but we're also being told to turn on our brains, to think about all of these things, and to learn the way of God. So this becomes a part where not everything's going to be spelled out. You, I mean, you know, this is... Now, we get examples throughout here of, well, let's say that this happens. Let's say that you walk up and you find a dead body and there's nobody who knows that this person how they died um, okay and I don't know if you remember what to do but what you're supposed to do at that point is because there's this dead body and it looks as if the person's been murdered I want you to find out what village is closest nearby and we don't know if that's the, the perpetrator is in that village but it looks like some wrong has been done and we're gonna offer, we're gonna kill um, an animal and, and it's, it's not a sacrifice, but it is going to be a marker so that we recognize that this has been done and something wrong has happened so that a curse doesn't go over the land. Now, why do you go through all that effort? For justice, what and what's the justice part? What's and I'll use this word righteousness. God wants to train us in righteousness. Every human life is created in the image of God. Every human life is valuable. Um, it, it is a tragedy, but it is also atrocious when a murder is takes place. And so what happens is, is it's like okay, I'm training you about how to respond. I'm training you not to be callous. I'm training, and, and so there's the specific stipulation, like in this one, okay, so you see a livestock animal, and obviously it, you know, it, it belongs to somebody. It's an ox or uh, it's a goat, and you know, somebody's livelihood, their well, welfare is, is dependent in part on this. I don't want you to be callous. I want you to actually inconvenience yourself. That's one example. But I want you to be wise about thinking about how you value human life. Does this make sense? So when you think of Torah, when you think of Old Covenant, what you should think about is, this is trying to give us wisdom on how to live. Here are specific stipulations, but we're supposed to turn our brains on. That's why I'm gonna be asking you a question in a moment and uh, about sexual purity. So I'll just get you there. Um, Okay, so, if you see your brother's donkey or his uh, ox fallen on the road, do not ignore it. Help him get it to its feet. And remember, again, this is coming under the overall heading of protecting human life or protecting life. Uh, do not murder. A woman must not wear men's clothing nor a man wear women's clothing for the Lord your God to test anyone who does this. This one is just kind of there. We're not quite, you know, I mean, it's, it's thrown out there. It's a command. Um, uh, it may contextually make more sense. Um, it may be related to some uh, idolatry practices that are in some way tie to death. But, you know, that's the part where sometimes you come along these things and we're, you know, we don't know the whole story and we try to figure it out, but sometimes we're not just quite sure. Um, every once in a while, you'll come across somebody who has a very, you know, strong opinion. On this one, I haven't heard anybody with strong opinions. We're just kind of like, it feels a little bit random, but there it is. Um, verse 6, 
if you come across a bird's nest beside the road, now I'll just give you a little bit of heads up because this is where we ended. Many rabbis um, consider this the least commandment. Like in, in the, in, uh, out of the entire list of Deuteronomy, this one is, is considered like the smallest. It's about a nest of birds. Um, but the reflection on it is, is that, you know, this least commandment ends up being significant because it has to do with the principle of do not murder, respect life, that life that we're learning to respect in some way is related to our creator. All of this is important. Um, if you come across a bird's nest beside the road, either in a tree or on the ground, and the mother is sitting on the young or on the eggs, do not take the mother with the young. You may take the young, but be sure to let the mother go so that it may go well with you and you may have a long life. Don't know how the mother felt about her eggs being taken from her. Now, this has a little bit of reminiscence of the commands about going to war. And when you go to war, don't cut down all the fruit trees. Um, you know, don't, don't pillage everything. Okay, you, you're, you're going along. I'll tell you like a little story, and, it, and, it, and it's a little bit of an analogy. When I was about five, my, my older sister and my cousin and I walked down to the local community pool, and we went swimming. And on the way back, they said, we should look for money. Now, as a five-year-old, I did not pay attention to the fact that they were walking in front of me and I was walking behind. And, and the likelihood of me finding money before them was, was fairly slim. But it happened. Uh, because they were looking for coins, and I found a $5 bill. <laughs> and, and so they walked right by it, and then here's this $5 bill, and I pick it up. And I'm like, woohoo, five bucks! And they say, what? You have to share that. And I'm like, no, I don't. I found it. It's mine. And they were, no, and so I ran home, mom, mom, you know. So now you're walking along and, you know, and this is the part, and, and here you discover eggs. Food is back on the table for breakfast this morning, right? But, but what it's saying is, is that, okay, this is a random blessing for you. But respect the blessing and, and don't be overly greedy. And so it seems to be, so yes, you can, you can take the young, but here's a full grown animal that's able to produce more. So let the mother live and then, and then you can take the eggs or the little chicks and, and do, you know, have a meal. And that basically it. Um, considered you know the least of all the commands but but it's still trying to train us about thinking about the sanctity of life the big and the small um, verse 8 when you build a new house make a parapet uh, around your roof so that you may not bring the guilt of bloodshed on your house if someone falls from the roof okay so it's a flat roof right Common construction for Israelites in this period. Sometimes they would take naps up on their roof. Some it would they, they would get work done up on their roof. It, there was lots of different purposes that they had, and God is concerned that you are conscientious. Here's a way that you're going to live. Um, take the time to build a railing so that somebody doesn't fall off your roof and die. Is that what a parapet is, a railing? Yeah. Um, so that, that's the part where it's picturing is, is you, you, it, so that you can avoid undue bloodshed. Now, here's an example, but it should lead us to think about those things. 
You know, I mean, this, 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 this becomes a part where, you know, you look at it and you go, okay, I want to be conscientious. We have, I built this thing. I've done this thing. I mean, it, you know, this should lead over to other things. You know, I mean, th this becomes the part where, um, you know, you're in a specific line of business and you have sharp things. You want to think about making it so that people won't, you know, be able to easily have access. Um, you know, this is the part about, um, you know, you can have, you know, there's, there's the debates in our country about gun laws, but what everybody should be agreement on is, is that, you know, that there should be proper training and safety with guns and people who own guns should store them in such a way that they're not easily accessible by people who don't know how to use them and could be harmed by them. Um, anybody that I know of who owns guns, who've been trained on how to use guns, they're very conscientious of the fact of the danger of guns, but, but that's how it should be. And, and so those become things where you, you listen to these things and it's like, okay, here's one example, but I should be thinking about this in other ways. Um, now, in this next section, beginning in verse 9, there's probably a transition going on here. And like in my NIV translation that I have, which is the older one from 1994, um, the title doesn't come later until marriage. But what you end up getting, um, in, which is in verse 13, marriage violations, you, you, we're moving into this mixing thing. And, um, and, and let me, I'll read them for you. They're, they're, they're of a small group. Do not plant two kinds of seeds in your vineyard. If you do, not only the crops of you, you plant, but also the fruit of the vineyard will be defiled. Do not plow with an ox and a donkey yoked together. Do not wear clothes of wool and linen woven together. Make tassels on the four corners of the cloak that you wear. Um, the making of the tassels is, is, is reiterating um, from Exodus, where they were told to have uh, four tassels um, and that these were to remind you um, to be holy and of the Exodus. Um, we don't get all the stipulation. What's interesting in, in that is that in the earlier Exodus, um, it uses a different word for tassels in Hebrew, but it, but it seems to be referring to the same thing here. Now, you, you get a negative, don't do this, don't mix linen and wool, do do this. So, in each one of these instances, minus the positive, which is, well, where are the tassels, but that's about so that you, it, it, you have a daily reminder as far as the, the freedoms that you have and, and the work of salvation that was done for you and to give thanks for it. You, you, you seem to have this, this focus on keeping things in their proper place. Don't, don't do inappropriate mixing together. Um, my guess is, is that in some way this is leading up into the, the, the fleshing out of do not commit adultery because it's in some way about purity and, and, the, and these references of purity are going to move quite quickly into sexual purity. Um, now, the sexual purity that we're called to takes place in a larger context of um, covenantal purity, religious um, purity. So one of the things to think about is, is that um, when one of the metaphors that were given in the Old Covenant is that this relationship between God and his people is like the relationship between a husband and wife. And committing adultery is analogous to committing idolatry. So there, there is a human component. Here's what takes place between human beings. And, and that same sort of thing is analogous of what happens when you chase after other gods. And so you get a little bit of this purity. So some of these, these initial practices, like the mixing together of wool and linen, the other nations do that. Some of it may even be involved, uh, involved in some of their religious practices. 
you guys aren't going to do that. You're holy, you're set apart, and you're, going, you're not going to live the way the rest of the nations live. Um, so, um, uh, mixing the crops. So, let's, probably a couple of things here. Let's say that you have a vineyard. And, um, and, and, and you have vines, and they're being supported by structures, and they're growing up. On that, on that ground where you're growing the grapes, don't also plant wheat and try to get every ounce of everything and squeeze it out of the land. You know, there's other stipulations that come in to allow it to have rest. Um, so... Specific stipulations, do not plow with an ox and a donkey yoked together. Um, it's probably dangerous for the donkey to be yoked to the ox. Um, and, uh, but, and not that it, it was probably a common practice, but it would look like for some reason those things happen once in a while. God said no. But there's kind of this flow of moving from don't squeezing things out, don't doing this, the wearing of the clothes, the clothes of wool and linen together. And then in verse 13, we've been talking about improper mixing. And now we come to stipulations on sexual purity. Um, so, here's my question. And, um, and my question to you is, why does God care about how we conduct ourselves as sexual beings? Why does he give specific commands, do not do this? And I'd like to hear your answers. Well, we're made in his image, and I think he honors the body. And he feels like that should be something set apart for that particular Okay, we're, we're made in his image, um, but we're made with the body. And so in some way, it is about honoring our embodiment. Um, okay. There's not a, there, there's, this is a, there's, there's, a, there, there's a lot to this. And so this is the part where I want to get you thinking about this of, you know, I mean, in our culture today, you know, we we are we are we are a sexualized culture. Sex sells everything. Sex is everywhere. Um, it, it, we're you know the push in our culture is to be very promiscuous. Um, you should be able to do whatever you want to do. So my question to you is really to think: Why does God put these stipulations? Other other thoughts. Something about our embodiment. I was always taught that the body is a temple. The body is a temple? Yep. When we hear that, so the one, one is we're taught that the body is a temple. Um, so there's, and there's two ways to hear that, and both are true, and this comes from the New Testament. Um, the individual human body is a temple, and then the body of Christ, which is the whole church is a temple as well and so both of those things are true the, the the reference to the body being a temple more commonly is referred to the whole church but it is also true individually and it gets used in regards to sexual immorality so your body is a temple so don't boy don't be joined together with prostitutes okay so it's our embodiment and our body is a temple what else other other thoughts Relationship and marriage, um, um, cultural marriage. Pos a positive thing of it's part of these are about respecting the relationship of marriage. Why is sex outside of marriage defiling? That, that this goes to the digging into it a little bit of okay, if your body's a temple and God says it's defiling, why is it defiling? Any, any 
thoughts on that? Being right is wrong. Yeah. Well, so the, one of the things that I want to encourage all of us to do is to really have a, an understanding of the biblical sex ethic. Because it, our culture needs help. And, it, you know, and, and what, what needs to happen is, is that we need to be able to sit there and to be able to engage in our culture on this discussion of sex and, not, and, and present a positive face to the gift, but also give reasonable and, and, um, and persuasive reasons for why there's restrictions on it. So, so that becomes a part where you say, okay, so why does God care about sex? Well, because he gave it to us as a good gift, but it's a gift that only is really good in a certain context. And so, you know, so it, it has to do with the nature of the gift. Um, it's intended to knit together two people into one flesh. And, 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 and that's what marriage is defined as. And so if you take this gift, which is given to be a, a, a part of the way in which these two people are knit together in a covenant relationship that's intended to be for life, and you take it out of that relationship and you start engaging in it with just random people that you're not committed to for your life, it actually does harm to you. That, that, that's some of our, our, our argument for you know, of, of what we've come to understand this gift to be. And so, you know, and so then you, you build analogies and you sit there and you say, you know, um, you make a car and, and you intend for it to run on gasoline. Go put diesel in it and see how it goes. It, 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 it'll, it'll ruin it. it. It's not good for it. So here's this gift. It was given for a husband and a wife. Now, and, and, and you see, there's, there's, you know, there's, there's realities of this gift. Some of them we've mitigated because of technology. Um, part of the reality of, of lovemaking is it's fruitful. And it's given to a husband and, and a wife that they might not only express love to one another, and they might please one another, but the nature of love and relationships is they grow. And this is also the way of procreation. It's not the only purpose of lovemaking, but it's part of it. And so this is where if you look at the gift for what it is, it's in, it, by, and, and we know this, I've talked about this in sermons before, that when it's a bodily thing, when you engage in lovemaking, there, there are chemicals that are released that, that are attachment chemicals that cause you to feel attached to this person because that's what the gift is intended to be it's intended to knit two separate people into one flesh and to form a greater unity that you're going to be committed to one another feel connected to one another be before one another in such a way that no matter what challenges difficulties you face you're, you're going to face them now together even while the world may try to pull you apart at times um, so that's a little bit, you know, of when we come to this, we're going to hear these, a little bit of the fleshing out, do not commit adultery. And then what comes along with this now is a fleshing out about the call, about what does this look like? Now, there, there's probably going to be a couple places that we struggle with a little bit in this. And um, because of the cultural gap, you know, we're picturing 3,400 years, and, um, and, and it is a society that, it has, um, that is different than ours. So with that in mind, let's, let's jump into this. Okay, so verse 13. If a man takes a wife, and after lying with her, which is a, a way of saying that they, they make love, they, they sleep, they have sex. I, I'm gonna, just so you know, I tend to, to do this. I'm gonna refer to the sexual act as lovemaking. Um, 
when it's in the context of a husband and wife. Um, when it's taken out of that context, I, I, I may refer to it as sex or something else. Even here, we get a little bit where it's referred to as rape, and we'll talk about that. But um, if a man takes a wife, and after lying with her, dislikes her, and slanders her, and gives her a bad name, saying, I married this woman, but when I approached her, I did not find proof of her virginity, then the girl's father and mother shall bring proof that she was a virgin to the town elder at the gate. Okay, remember the, the, at, the, at the gate of the town is where um, uh, cases are heard within, within different cities. So you've got a dispute. Where do you go? You go to the town gate and the, uh, the designated leader of that area sits there and will listen to cases and we will, we will work towards the truth. Um, hand is raised. I was raised in Iran, and when I was 13, my best friend was an Iranian girl who was also 13, and she and I were playing hopscotch one day, and she was getting married the next day. And she was telling me that um, on her wedding night, all the parents sat up, was just sitting outside their bedroom, and that her intended would have to bring out the proof of her virginity. And if not, um, she'd be kicked out. So there's, a, there's so this uh, Sherry's teach out sharing practices that are still done in parts of the world in the Middle East as far as culturally of uh, a young girl when she was young, 13, getting married. And the, you know it was a community event um, and, the, and there was needing to be proof brought out that, you know, that this was their marriage night and the first time that she had made love and it was with her husband. Now, the way that this scenario is written, it, it's written for the defense of an accused bride that is wrongly accused. Um, so this is given for protection of the woman, uh, you know, by and large, the women women had less rights than men in the ancient world, um, and th there is a debate um, among scholarship. Um, you know, was it in some way bed linens that would be brought out? There's some other speculations that um, you know that. That, that, that it would have been proof that she had had her um, period before, you know, from just before the wedding. And, and so she's, you know, so she's not pregnant entering into the wedding. Um, different biblical scholars have different positions. Some of them don't, don't mention it. But in some way, what you can assume from this is that culturally, there was an expectation that it would be some sort of an event. It was a community concern. Um, it, the, the, these become a little bit of the differences between our, our culture and, and their culture. You know, we're, we're individuals. Our sense of identity basically comes from within. In the ancient world, there, there, it was an honor-shame culture. Their sense of identity came from the community. And, and, and it was understood that the world's a tough place to live. It's precarious. 50% um, of kids die. Um, it, it, some, one of the worst tragedies in the world is, is that your line ends and, and you don't continue. And if, if a husband and wife aren't able to have kids. And, you know, and so, so all of that baggage is in here. Now, what this is guarding against is a man marries a woman, sleeps with her, and now he's not really liking her. And he decides, you know what, this was, nope, she's not the one, and let me put her out, and I will claim that she wasn't a virgin. Um, okay, so that's the situation. And... 
and there's protections given for the woman and her family, the girl's father and mother shall bring proof that she was a virgin to the town elders at the gate. The, the girl's father will say to the elders, I gave my daughter in marriage to this man, but he dislikes her. Now he has slandered her and said, I do not find your daughter to be a virgin, but here is the proof of my daughter's virginity. Then her parents shall display the cloth before the elders of the town, and the elders shall take the man and punish him. They shall fine him a hundred shekels of silver and give them to the girl's father. Now, why are they giving the shekels to the girl's father? Because he gave her back to him. Because, because what, it, it, what it then specifies is, is that he's going to have to keep her for, for, as a wife, and he can never divorce her. Now, I know there's this part where you hear this and you go, holy smokes, could you imagine? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, oh my goodness. But, but part of this is for the protection of the woman that she has shelter. Because she is now less desirable because she's already had made love. And, and, and then her husband kicked her out. I mean, she'd be out on the street... And the likelihood is that she's going to have a very short life. Well, so, so now she's the, very happy now. Yeah, not that she's very happy now. I know. Um, <laughs> there, a little bit of discussion and debate on this is that he can't divorce her, and I'll, I'll read it. So um, they shall find him a hundred shekels of silver, or give them to the girl's father, because this man has given an Israelite virgin a bad name. She shall continue to be his wife, and he must not divorce her as long as he lives. Uh, there's a little bit of debate. Maybe she could divorce him. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, um, but, you know, what this is all about is, is it's, it, it is about protection, and it's looking at some of the details. And, um, and because there is a valuation... Of the of keeping pure the marriage bed, of of not taking this gift of of love making outside of marriage, we one of the things is as well. It's about keeping the marriage together, and I and I know this is difficult, but but this really is intended for protection. Um, and what's given here is, is is that you as a husband aren't going to have the ability. To just willy-nilly accuse your wife of something, get a divorce, and and then move on to the next person. Um, you can't. In fact, what it says is, is you're not going to be able to do it. You're going to have to pay a hundred shekels, which is which is a large amount of money. The reason to the father is because if he gave it to his wife, he'd just be giving it to himself. Right. So this is the part where you've shamed this family. And so there's going to be a punishment. And so there you go. So there's your first situation. Verse 20. If, however, the charge is true and no proof of the girl's virginity can be found, she shall be brought to the door of her father's house and there the men of her town shall stone her to death. She has just done a disgraceful thing in Israel by being promiscuous while still in her father's house, you must purge the evil from among you. And so there's two sides of this coin. Um, you can't willy-nilly just accuse your wife of not being a virgin. But the family can't sit there and say, my daughter is a virgin when she's not. Um, and, and so that's one situation. Now, it takes very seriously this idea of do not commit adultery. This is not going to be the only example of do not commit adultery. Um, this is the part about saying this is serious stuff because this is about the integrity of the whole society, the family, 
the covenant relationship of marriage, which is all an analogy to the relationship of God and his people. If a man is found sleeping with another man's wife, both the man who slept with her and the woman must die. Here's the punishment. It says do not commit murder. adultery. Yeah. Now, when we, and that's what the ten, you know, that's what, what is it, the sixth commandment says, do not, yeah, six. <laughs> do not commit adultery. Um, adultery, by definition, is where you have a man sleeping with a married woman. Um, so he doesn't have to be married. No, he doesn't have to be married. Um, now, there's another thing where if it's if it's a single man and a single woman, we're, we're going to get there where it's going to spell out what you do, because that's a situation. But um, but it but it does not have the reverse of a married man sleeping with a woman who's not married, um, which. You know, is it wasn't stipulated against, but it it was not God's ideal. Sexual purity is one man, one woman, a husband and a wife in marriage. That's the only place that that um, love making should be done. But here's the next situation: if a man is found sleeping with another man's wife, both the man who slept with her and the woman must die. You must purge the evil from Israel. If a man happens to meet happens to meet in a town a virgin pledged to be married, and he sleeps with her, you shall take both of them to the gate of the town and stone them to death. The girl was in the town and did not scream for help, and the man, because he violated another man's wife. Now, this is again giving us a little information. You know, like. When, when we, moving all the way forward, 1,300 years after Deuteronomy was written, Joseph was betrothed to Mary, and she was found to be with child. And he was a righteous man. And, and, and in that culture, for that entire 1,300-year period, you would have this betrothal period where there would be an agreement between between a, a man and a family that he was going to take a daughter in marriage. And there would be a, a year period, typically, where would, he would go get his household in order, um, typically building a house, providing, getting things ready so that he could come and take his bride and, and have her be with him. In that year-long period of the betrothal, they were basically married. They, 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 they had not yet been wedded, but the agreement was struck. And if and now, if, you, if you're in this betrothed relationship where you're moving towards the marriage covenant, if you sleep with somebody else consensually, that's adultery. And now you're going to be treated as if it's adultery. Um, okay. And notice it's both the man who commits the adultery with the betrothed woman and the woman. Now, it specifies here that this is what you do if it takes place within a town. And then why, and, and then why is she found guilty? Because if it's in the town, she should have screamed out and somebody would have heard. But because it was in town, she didn't scream. And then that points to consensuality there. And, and so that's the rationale behind it. Now, again, you, you, you listen to this and what it's, what it's pointing to is, is that there's a difference between consensual and non-consensual sex. And when it's, when it's non-consensual, you're not going to do the same thing as when it's consensual. 
And then that's what the next thing happens. Well, when Mary was not stoned, is that because Joseph did not? Um... Okay, so it's a great question. So when Mary was not stoned, is that what was, you know, like with Joseph not? It was, and he did not. Now, by the time we get to that point, it would appear as if they are inconsistent in how they apply these these stipulations and regulations. Uh, you know, like like, like so, at, at one point, the, the, the they they look to throw Jesus off the cliff in Nazareth. Um, in another instance, they look to stone him. But then, you know, when it gets to Jerusalem and it gets down to it, they don't have the right to do capital punishment, so they have to go and ask for permission, and then that leads to his crucifixion. It, I'm sure it happened, but it doesn't seem to be a common occurrence that that stoning would always take place. And you know, and case in point, the woman caught in adultery. Notice the inconsistency with it. They only bring the woman out to be stoned before Jesus. They don't bring bring the man. And you know, and, and that's the part where it is like, and and Jesus knows. This isn't about righteousness. This is not about you guys keeping covenant. This is about you guys setting up a trap for me. Because if it was really about righteousness, the man would be here as well. And he's not. All you really care about is something else. You know, but and that becomes a part where it's like there's these outward stipulations, and this is the weakness of the law. You know, this is the weakness of the old covenant that Paul talks about. Is is it's not bringing about the heart regeneration. It, 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 it can't. It's written on stone tablets. This is the part where we need the Holy Spirit. For us to really live into this life, it's, it needs to be a supernatural event. We have a part to play, but we can't do it in our own strength. And that's what the new covenant is about. For us, because we're new covenant people... We need to look at these things and we need to look at what the heart of it is and we need to look at the heart issue of it and that becomes this part about, you know, for example, with sexual purity, it's about fidelity in the covenant of marriage. Um, it's also, you know, and it also has to do with honoring and respecting but also receiving and trusting the gift, you know, so you're, if you're two unmarried people, a man and a woman, and you, and you make love, you are not committing adultery. But you're still sinning. And we call it fornication. And it's not as a serious offense in the Old Covenant as, as adultery is, because it's not as a loaded event with meaning and purpose with regards to marriage. And, and we're going to hear this, where if, if you end up sleeping and it's two single people, then you know. Then it's possible to move forward into marriage. But but we'll keep reading. Is how's this going? Or is any questions? I just thought in her betrothal period, he didn't accuse her, and that's why. He oh yeah, back to the question of I, Joseph. I might have read that incorrectly. So what we get there is is that it said that Joseph is a righteous man, and instead of looking for vengeance. He, he's he's just going to let this go quietly, um, and 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 that's what's told. And 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 then he's given a vision, and an angel says, "No, no, marry her." And then after that, then he he does. Um, now, a big part of that story is is that you know that their entire life was and marriage was lived under a cloud of shame. When were you betrothed? When were you married? When was this child born? Uh, what was going on there? Um, okay. Thank you. Yep. Verse 25. But if out in the country a man happens to meet a girl pledged to be married and rapes her, the, the word there for rape is seizes her, and then it has a connotation because of this context. And so rape is a good translation. But the idea here is that he forces himself on her. 
So this is not consensual lovemaking. This is rape. Um, but if in the country a man happens to meet a girl, pledged to be married, okay, same scenario, right? She, she's betrothed. They, she's, she's not yet married, but it's like marriage. It's this year-long period of time or something around a year. And, um, and now, though, it's in the country. Here's what happens. Only the man who has done this shall die. Do nothing to the girl. She has committed no sin deserving death. This case is like that of someone who tax and murders his neighbor for the man found the girl out in the country and though the betrothed girl screamed, there was no one to rescue her. Um, verse 20, well, well, no, actually, I mean, you know, this, this I, you know, they, they, they did not have large urban centers. It was mostly agrarian. And so, you know, you could, and you could live, you know, miles from from a town and you know and they were concerned about these things but in some way she's out and some and so yeah verse 28 if a man happens to meet a virgin who is not pledged to be married and rapes her and they are discovered he shall pay the girl's father 50 shekels of silver he must marry the girl for he has violated her. He can never divorce her as long as he lives. Now, the, the, you know, this is one where from our culture, we're sitting there and I see a couple of women's faces out there and go, what? Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, and, um, and, and this is the part of, it's not the ideal, right? This is not the way that things should be. But there's every possibility that this woman, because she has been raped, will never be touched by another man. And then she won't have kids. She won't have protection. Her parents will die. And she may be left without any, any way of support. So what, what this sits there and says is, and again, it's a deterrent to the man. Um, okay, it, it may be that you don't know this person, and it may be that you know this person. If you don't know the person, you don't know if she's betrothed, married, you might figure it out if she's married, but you don't know if she's betrothed, or if she hasn't, if she's a virgin but hasn't been pledged. If you rape her, if you force yourself on her, you are either going to die or you're going to have to support her for the rest of your life. So, so this, you know, you have to look at what the law is intended to do. It's intended to be a deterrent from the aggressor from doing violence. It's intended also to set up protections. Um, again, it's not ideal, but we don't live in a world that's yet perfect. And so, um, so... So there, and there was a monetary, you have to pay to the father, um, 50 shekels, and then on top of that, you have to marry her, support her, and you never have the choice of divorcing her. Well, it seems the discovery part is an important factor because if they're not discovered, then she has really no right. I didn't hear that part though. I said it seems the discovery part is an important factor for the girl because if, if they're not discovered, Yeah. She's stuck. <laughs> um, verse 30, another one. Now, remember these are um, examples. Out of these examples, we should be learning basic principles. Um, but a man is not to marry his father's wife. He must not dishonor his father's bed. So, what it's picturing the um the father's the patriarch there's probably four generations living on, on on the land together 
the, the, the father is the oldest one. The, his, his first wife, who, who was your biological mother, died. He married another woman. Um, this would not be, this, the, these, these things would happen. Um, women died in childbirth, you would marry another. Now, he marries another, it's altogether possible. I mean, he's, it, it was normal that you married younger. He, married, he may have married somebody who was um, closer in age to you than closer in age to him. But what it's saying is, is that those two became one flesh. And so even though this isn't your biological mother, and even though she's closer in age to you, you don't marry her, period. Um, because she is as a mother to you, and for you to marry her is to do something that would be sexually defiling. It's not honoring the reality of what marriage is and what sex does, lovemaking does. So those those are the um, those are the beginning of the discussions about sexual purity. Um, and we have ten minutes. No, we're past. Oh, we're past, thank you. Okay. Uh, good. Perfect stopping point. Um, any last questions? Wow. <laughs> Pat? Okay, this takes place after Joseph and yes. Jake and, you know, Leah and Rachel. And yep, yep. This takes place after the patriarchs. So, um, uh, and, and then, of course, even after Genesis. Solomon and David and all the gang and, you know. So with, with, with that, I mean, this is the part, and, and Paul talks about this, you know, before the old covenant was given, it, you know, sin was not as rampant because there weren't as many stipulations, but you still see the inherent nature of the breaking of God's pattern because you look at the problems and you can read retrospectively and you can see all the headaches of really not knowing the words of life and then the consequences of not knowing that wisdom, and here's why life doesn't work well. Um, but with that, let us let me pray for us, Lord. We lift up our world, our society. Um, we are a broken uh, society sexually. Uh, may we, as your followers, uh, grow in wisdom and obedience and um, honor and respect for the way that you have created us as sexual beings. Pray this in Jesus' name.